Greetings. An uh, the archaeologists were excavating in southwestern part of Israel, and they found a sarcophagus, and inside they found a skeleton. And uh, one of the researchers later made an announcement. This man died of heart failure. Well, everybody was amazed. How, how do you know that? Well, I found a parchment by the skeleton, which I translated, and it said, I bet 5,000 shekels on Goliath. The reason I bring up that story, you may have heard it before, because I want to go back to a message I gave a couple of weeks ago. I was appreciating the response to that message. And I spoke about uh, women, females, that should be famous. <laughs> I talked about women that, uh, heroines in the Bible that I, I, I wanted to give more, <laughs> more publicity to. And one of them was Abigail. Uh, and I wanted to mention her great wisdom and how she spoke to David today, uh, which I didn't mention all of it last time. Uh, so in, in 20, verse 29 of 1 Samuel 25, when, <clears throat> when Abigail is speaking to David, <clears throat> she talks about how he's innocent <clears throat> and he's being pursued. Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life, but the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the eternal your God, and the lives of your enemies you shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. You, you see how the language she uses there? Go back to 1 Samuel 17 and the story of David and Goliath and what, you know, what he does with his sling. It's just amazing. So she really appealed to him very powerfully, just brilliant, a brilliant woman. And... Uh, there was a very brilliant woman, <clears throat> excuse me, in the founding of this country. I'm speaking, of course, in, in uh, Central Florida in the United States of America. And one of our, our, our second president was John Adams, and he was also uh, on the committee to write the Declaration of Independence. You know, he, uh, of course, Jefferson was, was the author, but uh, Adams was involved in, in, in the process. Anyway, uh, his wife, Abigail, named after this evidently this biblical Abigail uh, was uh, quite a, a figure in American history as well. Uh, I want to also express my uh, gratitude for the uh, reception of the message that I gave recently on the, on the design and structure of the of the uh, Masoretic text of the Old Testament, the traditional uh, Hebrew and Aramaic Tanakh. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry that I misspoke at the end of that talk. Uh, so let me clarify. I'm, I'm sure you all know if you heard me, uh, that if you heard that talk. Uh, but the uh, next to the last book as uh, in the Tanakh uh, is Ezra and Nehemiah as considered one long book. You have one section, uh, the final section of the Hebrew Old Testament, Hebrew and Aramaic Old Testament, uh, uh, and uh, I went to a, a uh, small Christian college in Northeast Texas, and there we, we, we uh, were tr trained to call that section the Latter Restoration Books. And uh, it, it, th that is Daniel, <clears throat> Ezra, and Nehemiah, and First and Second Chronicles, and they're considered, you know, Ezra and Nehemiah is one book, First and Second Chronicles as another long book. So I hope that clarifies uh, what, what I was talking about at the end of the talk la last time. Uh, Daniel, although had a, bit, a lot of prophecy, he didn't really occupy the office of a prophet. <clears throat> Excuse me, he rather occupied a secular office as virtually second in command <laughs> of the uh, Neo-Babylonian or Chaldean Empire. And later on, I think he had a similar position in, for a time with the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, and those books are important for distinguishing where God w was working in those days. The, uh, the, there was a counterfeit religion to the north, a, a counterfeit of biblical Judaism, if you want to call the re that's a, one way to label that religion at that time, you know, the, re the worship of Yahweh, the true worship of, of, of the God of the Bible. There was a, another version of it, a perversion of it, to the north in Samaria. There was the Samaritan religion. So to establish where where, uh, where God's church in those days was, uh, we have those those final books which focus on the uh, Davidic monarchy, the Levitical priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood, and the the and Jerusalem, 
uh, as the, the focus of God's work in, in, in that period and the future focus of God's work. Uh, so anyway, that uh, ties up maybe that loose end, and I'm sorry that I misspoke. Today I want to give a, uh, a, a memory aid for biblical wisdom. A memory aid for biblical wisdom. Now we need wisdom and we need divine wisdom. Uh, in uh, James 1 and verse 5, we're encouraged uh, to, to, to uh, ask for it, to pray for it. Uh, in uh, James 1, 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given uh, uh, to him. And uh, I decided to dip into pop culture, and and uh, I've done this before, and to give a, a memory aid for biblical wisdom. <clears throat> now, we as Christians should not be involved in gambling, quite frankly. I would say no. <laughs> Uh, we as Christians should not be involved in gambling. But ironically, a very popular song uh, called The Gambler, uh, a, one can take the lyrics to that song and it, it becomes a kind of uh, pop culture of, uh, paraphrase of the book of Ecclesiastes. The great songwriter, uh, the great country western composer John, uh, Don Schlitz, uh, that was his first big hit back in 1978 as performed by Kenny Rogers. And Kenny Rogers is no longer with us, but I would imagine that, you know, that song is still uh, well known and, 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 and often often listened to. So I wanted to take uh, the, the, take that song to Gambler and, and weave it into a, a, a sermon that I hope will be will help you to just remember a lot of very important <laughs> verses. Uh, that that will, will help us in terms of biblical wisdom. It'll be a memory aid for biblical wisdom. So with your permission, we'll, we'll delve into that. And uh, we start, by, uh, the, the song begins by saying, on a warm summer's evening, on a train bound for nowhere. Let's talk about a warm summer's evening. You know, the, the judgments of God historically fell upon his people in, in midsummer. And that is why uh, the Jews today have the fast of the fourth month and then the very very important fast of the fifth month. And uh, on the fast of the fifth month, on the ninth of Av, sometimes observed on the tenth, <clears throat> uh, they read, of course, the book of Lamentations. And um, Lamentations ends with this lament. You know, we've sinned, we've been punished, and now we're praying for relief, right? And restoration. So in, in, in uh, Lamentations 5.21, turn us back to you, O Eternal, and we shall be restored. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are very angry with us. So even as the song begins, you know, we can, ima we can think about uh, God's judgment. And then it talks about a train bound for nowhere. And that's really the message of the book of Ecclesiastes. You know, what, what, what the value do we have in this life? You know, the Greek philosopher Socrates, Socrates tells us that, suppo uh, supposed to have said that the unexamined life is not worth living. If you want to have a meaningful life, it should be, should be a good life. Otherwise, you know, it's just vanity. The, the, the book of Ecclesiastes, and James covers that too, book of James in the New Testament. The, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And you find that as the first half of the book ends in Ecclesiastes 6 and verse 9. And you find that at the end of the book, right before the final appendix of six verses. So all through that book, you know, Haval Havalim, Hakol Hevel. A train bound for nowhere. I met up with the gambler. Okay, now, in a sense, you know, as I said, Christians should not be gambling, but in a sense, life is a gamble. You make decisions, and, you know, you don't know in advance how they're going to turn out. And in Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 11, uh, we're told that we need to make peace with, with reality. Uh, I, I returned, this is a 9-11 of Ecclesiastes, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, 
but time and chance happened to them all. That's the way it is. Now, what's interesting about this gambler is if you keep reading, you'll see that he, he doesn't seem to be particularly prosperous or doing particularly well himself. You know, it's like he's, he's learned a lot from the school of hard knocks. But he perhaps, you know, perhaps in a sense you, in a sense you could tell about him, you do as I say, not as I do, or at least do as I wish I had done now that I, now that I know. And that's really the case with Solomon. Solomon, who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, had been the wisest of people, and yet he, he had considered himself somehow an exception to the rule. Uh, and I had talked about him before, of course, many times, but in 1 Kings 4 and verse um, 30, it says, Thus Solomon, well, I'll go to verse 29, uh, 1 Kings 4:29. And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on, on the sea <coughs> excuse me <coughs> excuse me like the sand on the seashore. Let me read that uh, better because I had a cough there. And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Uh, thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. And he, of course, gathered a lot of the wisdom of Egypt and put, put that into the book of Proverbs. And yet, what happened with Solomon? He didn't follow, evidently, he didn't follow his own advice. Let's go to 1 Kings 11 and verse 11. Because of his sins, uh, the kingdom later uh, was split. So you could say he blew it. Uh, verse 11 of 1 Kings 11. Therefore, the Eternal said to Solomon, because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I'll surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. And I, I won't go any further with, with, with clear, uh, explaining all of the details. You can, you can continue to read. So perhaps at the end of his life, Solomon did finally realize, I blew it. And so we had the book of Ecclesiastes, and perhaps he did repent. And so, in a sense, there, you know, there's a future for Solomon, but still the price had to be paid. You know, he, it was too little too late as far as the, the future of the kingdom was concerned. And though, so that's similar with this man here. You know, he, he doesn't seem to be a great success, but yet he does have a lot of wisdom. He's, he, now, you know, as, as we understand later, he's um, uh, about at the end of his life. So anyway, I made up. We were, I met up with a gambler. We were both too tired to sleep, you know. So they're overtired, they're weary, and uh, you know sometimes life can get that way. Uh, the uh, Book of Ecclesiastes at the end, uh, and those of us who've been involved in in graduate studies, you know, could attest to this. Uh, it says. Um, Verse 12 of Ecclesiastes 12, And further, my son, be, in, be admonished by these, of making many books there is no end, and much study is wearisome of the flesh. You know, wearisome to the flesh. So, uh, okay, so they're too tired to sleep. They're overtired. They're just, they're not relaxed, I guess, but they're overtired. And so we took turns of staring out of the window at the darkness. And once again, you know, the vanity of, of, of life is brought out here. The boredom overtook us, and he began to speak. He said, Son, I've made a life out of re reading people's faces and knowing what the cards were by the way they held their eyes. You know, I, I remember years ago reading about people who, when they negotiate, would wear sunglasses so the other person couldn't really read their expression fully. So if you don't mind my saying, I can see you're out of aces. For a taste of your whiskey, I'll give you some advice. Well, obviously, you know, people often finally come to repentance after they've uh, they've had some setbacks. They realize, you know, their their need to change their life. Uh, I go back to Psalm 90. Uh, it says, um, this is a Psalm of Moses, and uh, he says, Tashev uh, Enosh Adaka. You know, Enosh is a a very fancy word for a human being emphasizing the, the delicacy the frailty of the human being he says Ta, uh, you, you turn man to destruction and you, and, and you say return O children of men and here we have men as Adam 
you know, the, the coming from the earth. You know, you you reduce man to his basic earthiness and you tell him, return. You know, so once he's humbled, then he's in a proper frame of mind. You know, Moses, for example, 40 years, he was a great general, evidently, and then 40 years as a shepherd. And so he's humble now. When God asks him to go back, he's, he, why me, right? In the beginning, he, he thought he was going to be a great hero. Didn't work out that way. But 40 years later, God makes him a hero, but he's very humble about it. So anyway, um, this man is out of aces. So I handed him my bottle. So he says, for a taste of your whiskey, I'll give you some advice. Uh, and so I handed him my bottle, and he drank down my last swallow. Then he bummed a cigarette and asked me for a light. So both of these men, evidently, you get the idea, they drink too, too, too much, and, and, uh, and they smoke. Uh, and, you know, so the idea is, you know, again, go book back to the book of Ecclesiastes. There's none of us that are perfect, and all, everybody has his flaws. And in Ecclesiastes 7.20, it says, For there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. You know, there, we, that's just the way we are. We are flawed. And uh, let's go to Romans, the third chapter, and the 23rd verse. You all, many of you know this verse, of course. <clears throat> For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All right, so here are two sinners, <laughs> but one is older and wiser, and so he's giving uh, advice. So he, and so here we go. Uh, and, uh, he, and the night got deathly quiet, and his face lost all expression, said, if you're going to play the game, boy, you've got to learn to play it right. All right, so... Uh, Let's go to uh, verse 11 of Ecclesiastes 12. You know, if we're going to live, we need to know how to live. And the Bible is there for us as our guide. You know, it's like the manual. You have a machine, there's a manual that comes with it. And when all else fails, you read the instructions. So Ecclesiastes 12, 11, the words of the wise are like goads. And the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. Ultimately, God is inspires all of these books with the various authors. So he says, you've got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them. Of course, he's talking about cards. Know when to hold them, know when to fold them. We have to keep in mind, very importantly, you know, our goal in life. And, uh, you know, obviously, chiefly, it's found in, in Matthew 6 and verse uh, 33. Uh, Matthew 6 and verse 33. Uh, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So that's the key, you know, we hold on to that. And then other things you may have to jettison in order for that goal, in order to reach that goal. I want to go to 2 uh, Corinthians, the 10th chapter. 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter and the 5th verse. And here we're told, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And there's a lot of distractions and challenges that are trying to, you know, veer you away from that straight and narrow path, uh, as Jesus talks about, that leads to eternal life. And so we, you know, we, we fold them, <laughs> we drop them. Uh, casting down arguments and, and every high thing that exalts itself to, uh, against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So, you know, know when to hold them, know when to fold them. And then he goes on to say, know when to walk away, know when to run, you know, because you're dealing with, you know, with a rough environment. And we have to realize that too, that we're, we're a sheep among wolves, as we see in, in Matthew 10, you know. Uh, uh, well, I'm in Matthew, so maybe I'll turn to the 10th chapter. I hadn't necessarily planned to tur turn there. Matthew 10, 16, Jesus says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Now, there are certain situations that you should simply walk away from. And, and uh, you normally know what they are. You just have the, the strength of character to walk away. Psalm 1, blessed, and also you could say blessed and happy, ashrei in the Hebrew, is like the Greek word makarios. 
Blessed is the man who walks not in the, in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. All right? There's cer certain things to, to stay away from. And then you also have to know when to run. Some things, you know, you can't just um, dilly-dally around, uh, you know, uh, be because they're very powerful uh, pressures. You just have to run. Uh, I want to go to uh, 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. A great teacher of mine, uh, he's not alive anymore. Um, you know, by the way, the song, the singer who made the song famous, Kenny Rogers, I believe he died last year, I'm speaking, in 2021. But long uh, years before that, a great teacher of mine died. But there's a story that's told about him. <clears throat> He was in Tijuana, Mexico, and evidently a prostitute approached him, and he just started running the other way. <laughs> he remembered this verse. 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee sexual morality. This is what Paul says. Flee sexual immorality. This is not the message you get from pop culture now. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. <clears throat> and uh, in this same book, in the 10th chapter, I want to go to verse 14, uh, 10, 14, uh, after talking about the example of ancient Israel, Paul says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. And there's a form of idolatry that's very dangerous in modern times, and that is the, the cult where a certain individual sets himself up as almost a godly figure. And uh, you need to be careful uh, of that kind of thing. Uh, flee that kind of thing therefore my beloved flee from idolatry verse 14 uh, then he goes on to say uh, you never count your money when you're sitting sit, sitting at the table I have to get into this way of talking there'll be time enough for counting when the deal is done so don't count your money when you're sitting at the table. I guess there's various reasons for that. Number one, you don't want to draw attention to yourself. Number two, you don't want to get complacent or desperate, you know, either one. But uh, it's important to realize, you know, we, we don't have it made. Uh, it, it, again, back there in 1 Corinthians 10, um, uh, in verse 12, uh, it says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So, uh, you know, don't think you've got it made till the, you know, uh, while you're still, while, pretty much while you're still alive. Uh, and then uh, on the, uh, we, we have 2 Corinthians, I want to go now to 2 Corinthians 10, 12. It says, for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. You know, don't, don't uh, count your cards uh, don't count your money when you're sitting at the table. You know, uh, don't compare yourself to somebody else. Uh, compare yourself to Jesus Christ. That you know, let's not uh, get on our high horse. Because I just read to you, we all have our problems. Uh, for we dare not class ourselves. This is for Second Corinthians ten twelve. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measure themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. No, our standard is Jesus Christ. Matthew 5, 48. You know, become you therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And God, and God says something similar to Abraham back in Genesis 17, 1. So that's our standard. Jesus Christ is our standard, and we don't compare ourselves to other people. Like the, like the uh, Pharisee in Luke 18. You know, I'm glad I'm not like that fellow. Well, yeah, maybe in some ways you're not. Maybe in some ways you're. Other ways, maybe you. It may be worse. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and there'll be time enough for counting when the dealing's done. Now, Paul, at the end of his life, you know, he th there he knew as he was about to be martyred, uh, you know, as his life was about to end, you know, he was confident at the conclusion. Uh, I want to go to Second Timothy, uh, the fourth chapter. At that point, Paul could say. Um, In um, uh, 
Am I in 2 Timothy? Um, 4 and verse 7. Um, because he knows he's going to die. I'm going to go to verse 6. Uh, Paul says to second, in 2 Timothy, for I, for I am already feeling being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He can say this now. He's about to be martyred. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to, be only, to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing, which <laughs> I hope and pray includes us. You know, so, uh, but in the meantime, just realize that, um, you know, we're all in the same boat, as it were. And uh, as Hebrews 9 and verse 27 tells us, I'm turning there now. And it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. All right. And then I want to go to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, I'm in 1 Corinthians still. Sorry. Okay, Second Corinthians 5, and I want the, the 10th verse. Uh, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or evil. So there's a judgment, there's an accounting, uh, and that comes, you know, that comes at the end. There'll be time enough for counting when the dealing's done. And then he goes on to say, Every gambler knows that the secret to survival is knowing what to throw away and knowing what to keep. Uh, that's in very important. First Thessalonians 5. You know, a lot of you probably figured right away that's where I was going. Okay, so First Thessalonians 5 and verse 21. Again, a familiar verse to many of you, I hope. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5.21 Test all things, hold fast what is good. All right? So, knowing what to throw away, knowing what to keep. For every hand's a winner and every hand's a loser. I just showed you before, you know, uh, that time and chance happens. There, we have our ups and our downs. Every hand's a winner and every hand's a loser. And the best you can hope for is to die in your sleep. You know, this life, what, what do you get out of this life ultimately? The only thing you take with you is the character you've developed in this life. That's really what, what life is all about. Although, <laughs> you know, we have a lot of other ideas that are thrown at us, but that's really what life is all about. You know, fulfilling our uh, incredible human potential as, as uh, a... Uh, a minister years ago, a pastor general of the church that I was uh, working for, you know, he, he would always talk about the incredible human potential. And uh, I want to talk about this concept of, of, of dying. Uh, if, if we are, are, have a relationship with God, he's going to be with us all our life, all the way until we die. And then even beyond that, that's the whole point. Because, you know, we, we, as Christians, we can look forward to the resurrection of the just and going from physical to spirit. And I want to go to Psalm 48 along those lines. Uh, Psalm 48 and the conclusion of that psalm. And you should check it in different translations and it'll support what I'm telling you. Psalm 48, uh, he says uh, in verse 14 at the conclusion of that psalm, For this is God, our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even to death. But if you think about it, uh, that, uh, that uh, even to death, if you sort of put those words together, it's like for eternities, forever and ever and ever. And even Almut could be translated over death. You know, he's going to guide us unto death, but even over death into eternal life. And so uh, there are many translations that look at it that way. So he guides us all our lives and then even beyond. All right. And then he goes on to say, And when he'd finished speaking, he turned back toward the window, crushed out his cigarette, faded off to sleep. You know, again, this concept of like Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And somewhere in the darkness, the gambler, he broke even. But in his final words, I found an ace that I could keep. 
And I already read that verse in Ecclesiastes 12. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it again. You know, the, it's important for us to, to study the Bible and to get out of it the wisdom that we need to, to proceed in this life. Uh, as he says again, in verse, I'll go to verse 11. The words of the wise are like goads, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. I'll go back, I'll go to another verse along those lines uh, as well. I want to go to Psalms 12. Uh, there's a group called My Soul Among Lions that has a beautiful musical version of this. Uh, and since we're talking about music today, I want to go to Psalm 12 and uh, around verse 6. The, uh, uh, the words of the eternal are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times you shall keep them O eternal you shall preserve them from this generation forever you, sh you I'm going to repeat verse 7 you shall keep them O eternal you shall preserve them fr from this generation forever and indeed <laughs> you know uh, how many thousands of years later we have this canon here that can guide and direct our lives so uh, this man says, the gambler, he broke even, but in his final words, I found an ace that I could keep. And uh, so the chorus goes, right? You've got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. You never count your money when you're sitting at the table. There'll be time enough for counting when the dealing's done. <clears throat> so with uh, apologies to... Uh, to Kenny Rogers and Don Schlitz. <clears throat> you gotta know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. You never count your money when you're sitting there at the table. There'll be time enough for counting when the dealing's done. Let's go to Psalm 24, Psalm 27 rather, Psalm 27. So you see, I'm never gonna become a country western star. Psalm 27 and verse 4. One thing I have desired of the eternal, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the eternal all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the eternal and to inquire in his temple. You, you see where David's focus was, a man after God's own heart. <clears throat> and now I want to go to Ecclesiastes, the final conclusion there, uh, in verse 13. Because I do believe this song, The Gambler, tends to be uh, very much like the book of Ecclesiastes in my thinking. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work, I'm sorry, yes, every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And now I do want to go to Matthew 6 and verse 33. And repeat it again as a conclusion to this talk. Matthew 6 and verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So today I have given you, in this country western song, a uh, reminder, a, a, a memory aid, a memory aid of biblical wisdom. I hope it's been helpful. All the best to you and yours.